Good afternoon. On behalf of the Islesboro Forum Committee, welcome to the second program of the 2020 Islesboro Forum Speaker Series. I am Gail Jackson and the moderator of today's program. This is our 28th year of presenting distinguished speakers who are experts in a wide variety of fields from science to humanities to topics of special interest to the island community. It is our 28th year, but it's our first year presenting the programs streamed live via Zoom webinar. While it's not the same as having speakers in the flesh with us on the island, this format has enabled us to think outside the box. In fact, our August 2nd speaker will come to us all the way from Hawaii. Others will be speaking to us from New York, Washington, Islesboro, and Booth Bay, Maine. This year's programs are the product of the forum committee's ideas, but we wish to engage you in the speaker selection process as we think ahead to 2021. You are invited to go to the islesboroforum.org website and share your ideas. And while you are there, please hit the donate button. Our costs for six programs will be about $1,000, and that does not account for the many volunteer hours donated by the committee. We hope you will consider the programs of value and want to support them with a donation of as little as $10 or more. Before I close these introductory remarks, I want to acknowledge and thank the eight other committee members for their terrific support and ideas. Their names are listed on the website and they deserve your recognition. Finally, I acknowledge the invaluable contribution of our technical producer, Michael Hutcherson. He's a wizard at what he does and is making the delivery of these programs possible. A quick reminder as to our format, our speaker will deliver her remarks. After that, we will have time for Q&A using the Q&A function you should find at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. Now I will turn the program over to Craig Olson, the island resident who brings us today's speaker. Craig will introduce Shay Conover, who is an entrepreneur and authority on the farming of mussels in Islesboro's waters. Craig, over to you. Thank you, Gail. I can't believe I have known Shay Conover for 17 years. Uh, we did a little bit of research and it's uh, time flies. Uh, you know, Shay came to the island in August of 2003 as an Island Institute fellow. Uh, she is a graduate of the James Madison University. And she came here to work on a GIS town for town information management and also work on school curriculum. And I remember well the large, huge Dell computer that was in the, uh, in the town office when Shay came to work on behalf of the Island Institute, which probably now that computing, uh, that computing power fits in our pocket. It's been unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable transformation. After Shay was here, she worked here for two years as an island fellow. She went to work at the Island Institute as a regular full-time staff member. She started doing GIS there, commuting daily from Islesboro. Um, she then kind of worked her way up within the Island Institute. She became senior programs director, vice president of operations, and when she left in 2017 to work full-time on uh, she and Josh's business, she was the vice president of programs. So, also, what seems to happen with fellows, and I've seen it happen here three times, uh, Shay met an Islander, Josh Conover, and they were married in 2006. Their two boys, Harper, who's now 12, can't believe that, and Finley, 10, uh, who is 10, attend Islesboro Central School. Josh, as you know, is a lobsterman on the island, and in 2013, Shay and Josh bought Islesboro Marine Enterprises from George Evans. Again, it seems like it was only a couple of years ago. Along the way, while working full-time with young children, Shay found time to spend six years as a member of the school committee for Islesboro Central School. She completed just this year her first year 
as member of the Allisboro Board of Selectmen. Uh, and I know that diversification for Shea and Josh is key uh, for them and the long-term survival of their business. Um, lobstering, the boatyard, and now their aquaculture operation are the kind of the three legs of the stool that will help them build that business, support their family and the families of their employees. In 2016, Shea and Josh were the first cohort of the Island Institute's Aquaculture Business Development Program, which I work there now, we call the ABD program, and it helped get new aquaculturalists in the water. What happened with this program is it, it allowed people to look at not only types of species they could raise, the capital they might need to start and sustain a business. Uh, it went right down to helping them find the proper site for their operation and going through the permitting process with the State Department of Marine Resources. That same year, 2016, they put their gear in the water for the first time and are now developing their Marshall Cove Mussels brand, which is growing exponentially. Um, it's a fascinating story, and I like you can't, can't wait to hear it. So please join me in welcoming Shea Conover to the Isles Isleboro Forum. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Craig. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's I'm sorry that we can't be in the same room, but it's nice to see you virtually and to see so many familiar names. And um, I'm excited and uh, considered a privilege to be able to tell our story. Um, we've learned a tremendous amount over the past four years that we've been building our farm, but the thing is, I know that we also have a tremendous amount more to learn. So um, catch me in another four years and, and the story will definitely be different. Um, I wanted to start out a little bit today just to uh, talk a little bit about why we decided to diversify into aquaculture. Um, give a farm tour in normal summers. We are pleased to be able to offer a couple of farm tours and get folks out on the rafts. Obviously, that's not possible this year, but we'll give you the best virtual tour uh, we can and give you a sense of what it really looks like to bring a uh, mussel from seed to table. Um, and then just talk a little bit about uh, how what we are doing fits into broader trends in the seafood industry in the state and nationally and um, you know, sort of how things have evolved, particularly over the last year. We have as everyone, you know, gone through a lot of a lot of changes, and I think, as a result, we're we're learning and uh, hopefully growing stronger. So, uh, as Craig mentioned, many of you likely know my husband Josh uh, Conover. Um, so why did why did we start this? Well, Josh, um, as you know, loves nothing more than to find ways to work, sometimes play, but usually work on the water. Um, when he graduated college, he uh, came back to lobster full time. Um, when he came back, he also was exploring actually starting a mussel farm at that time. It was um, about 20 years ago, uh, which is scary to say, but it was um, when Great Eastern Mussel down in Bristol was uh, supporting, encouraging mussel farms growth and uh, supporting folks to get into the water. Uh, at that time, it didn't make sense for him to put a farm in the water, but it nevertheless planted the seed that sort of stayed there over uh, many, many years. Um, so he focused on lobstering and then on Islesboro Marine. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a great team of people that work for us who enjoy working on the water and are always interested in exploring new ways uh, to to work, to work on the water. So um, that was sort of happening in his head at the same time, uh, as Craig mentioned, I was working at the Island Institute and was really focused um, sort of academically on how to support communities in, um, how to develop programs to support communities in diversifying their economies, particularly focused on marine economies. Uh, I was a fortunate to do quite a bit of work with how to support working waterfront access um, and had a lot of conversations about the concern that the exponential growth that had been seen in the lobster industry was not sustainable. That it was an acknowledgement that there was a lot of good times right now, but a lot of concern about what might happen in the future. And um, you know that sort of started planting some seeds. So, um, I was at the Island Institute when the Aquaculture Business Development Program started. 
I got pretty excited ab about it and said, hey, do you, do you mind if my husband and I join in this program? I know it's a little strange as a, as a staff member, but um, you know, we're, we're seriously considering getting into this and, and we would appreciate um, the opportunity. And uh, what that really allowed us to do is meet more folks in the aquaculture industry to talk to other farmers and to get a sense of what we could um, maybe actually really start doing. Um, so the pieces started falling into place. Um, we had a team of people uh, at Islesboro Marine that we are were interested in being able to keep employed full time year round. Um, and so we, we jumped in. We also sort of figured, you know, while lobstering is good, now is when times are better is when the time to make an investment in diversification. When uh, times are harder, it's a lot, you know, is when you need to have that plan in place, but it's much more difficult to make the leap. So that was kind of one of the reasons why we felt, you know, now was the time in, 20, in 2016. Um, so right now we have uh, five full-time, uh, five employees, that work on the mussel farm, um, three full-time and two part-time year-round. Uh, during the summer, we add five, uh, four more part-time positions, um, primarily summer residents, um, college students that are here. Uh, actually, Sundays is a harvest day, so we've got a full team of people working right next door uh, doing the final bagging process right now. Um, but it has been a real pleasure to uh, use this opportunity as a way to get more, to get to know a different group of people that we wouldn't necessarily have engaged with in the past has been, um, has been really great. And it's been really important for us too, to have more employees during a very busy time of year. Um, so Michael, would you mind starting the screen share? What I thought I'd do is I, I just have pictures. I'm not gonna do a lot of reading from slides, but I, I wanted to show you some, some pictures of what it looks like. Um, so we are called Marshall Cove Mussels. We, we developed that brand because as many of you know, Islesboro Marine is located on Marshall Cove and that's our home next door. And so it's a place that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, it's not actually where we grow the mussels. Uh, our mussels are grown on two different lease sites. Uh, one is a six acre lease site in Northport, just south of the Bayside community. And the second lease site is pictured here. That is a four acre lease site uh, just uh, next to Flat Island. Um, we currently have nine rafts that are in operation. Six of them are, you can see, there on our Northport lease site. Um, it's a detailed application process to go, to go through the state to get a lease site. And we can talk a little bit about that if there's any questions. Um, but so these are what the rafts look like. They're each 40 by 40 foot. Um, in 2016 and 2017, while they were getting built, the ferry crew was constantly teasing us, well, what are you gonna bring on the ferry next? Because you know all of these came over on trucks and uh, were assembled in the yard as much as possible, and then we raced to complete the process down in Marshall Cove during low tide. So racing the tide, getting things together so that they were ready to float uh, when the tide came back in. Uh, each of the rafts holds uh, approximately 400 lines. Um, and we have a processing barge that was shown in the last picture. You'll see a little bit more, a little bit more of that. You wanna to go to the next slide? Yep, so there you go, perfect, thank you. Um, so each raft has 400 lines. Uh, the rope that is on it is actually specialty uh, rope. They call it fuzzy rope. Uh, and it's designed so that ha it has a greater surface area to be able to collect mussel seed. Uh, and so that it has something uh, to bis onto strongly. Uh, all of our mussel seed is uh, started from the wild. So there's really no in inputs necessarily. We put our gear in the water and we select the sites that we do because it's all about where, where you are already naturally getting a, a mussel seed set. That's 
one area where uh, operating Islesboro Marine was incredibly helpful. When you service lots of moorings around the island, you see where there are a lot, which moorings have mussel seed on them at the beginning of the year. And, and that gives a pretty good indication of what might be a good mussel site. Um, mussel, to site a mussel uh, operation is pretty specific uh, conditions on the water. You want a depth that's around 50 to 60 feet. You want it to be relatively flat preferably mud bottom. Um, and so that was sort of the characteristics that we were looking for in siting our farm. It takes about 18 months from uh, seed to table, so from the seed starting uh, and getting on the line until it is ready to harvest. Um, so I think you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a picture of what it looks like. So we, uh, mussel spawn is, it's all about time of year. So mussels spawn uh, usually around here between April and May, um, but it is really site dependent um, and it's largely we found driven by water temperature. So when the water temperature is generally crossing um, the line around 50 degrees is when mussels begin to spawn. Um, the picture on the left is what mussel seed looks like from, I mean, this is likely familiar to you. You see it on your, on your docks, right? But that was a seed that we got off our lines in uh, about August. And on the right is that same, um, year class in September. So it's really growing uh, rapidly. We can go to the next slide. So this starts the process of the, the sort of machinery part of our harvesting. Um, so the process starts by putting, well, so I'll, I'll take one step back. Uh, we have we have nine rafts, and the goal is to have a continuous cycle of, of mussels. You have about a third of the rafts that are available for collecting mussel seed. You have a third of the rafts that are available for having um, seeds growing into the next year class, and you hope to be harvesting, be able to harvest from about three rafts. So in April and May, we put um, yes. 1,200 lines in the water um, to collect mussel seed. Each line is about 40 feet long, that fuzzy rope that you saw in an earlier picture. Um, we coil it by the surface because what we found is that at least on our sites, we have a greater seed density when the lines are, you know, generally around 10 feet below the water. Um, about this time of year is when, once the seed set starts to happen, we actually drop the lines so that they're hanging on the on the float and until they grow out to about an inch in size. Um, once it reaches that inch in size, it is it's time to start getting back to work. Um, and what that looks like is calling up each of those uh, 1,200 lines, uh, stripping the seed mussels off of them, uh, and then resocking them on at a density that makes them um, it easier for them to grow in a uniform way so that when it comes time to harvest, everything is, is roughly the same size, which is a way to increase efficiency and also a way to have the, the mussels happier and, and growing at a more rapid rate. So the machinery that you're looking at there is actually what the, the resocking process looks like. So we've stripped the seed lines. Um, you can see the hopper in the back and, and then the mussels are getting fed through at a specific density and are being wrapped in this cotton tubing and um, to keep them on the line. The goal for, for that actually is the mussels as they grow are able to uh, push their way through that netting at the same time that the cotton tubing is, is disintegrating and so is biodegrading. So um, what you're left well, well uh, what you're left with is you can go to the next slide is nice uniform mussel lines that are happy and feeding and 
uh, and that is that is the goal. Um, one of the things that we um, so muscle farming has been happening in the state of Maine for decades, but as a state and you know really as a country, aquaculture is um, particularly muscle aquaculture is very much in its infancy. Prince Edward Island is very far ahead of us. They have a gigantic blue mussel industry. Um, Spain is uh, also has a lot of um, mussel industry. And so as we were getting started in this, there is not a lot of equipment that you can purchase in the state of Maine. So all of our fuzzy rope came from uh, Canada. Um, the socking machine that was in the last picture uh, was imported from Spain, as is the socking material. Every few years when we need to order it, we actually need to import it from Spain. Um, and then the other equipment that, that you're going to see in a little bit is also imported from Prince Edward Island. So um, one of the things that I found really interesting with this process is that in just the past four years, although um, there has not been a tremendous um, increase in the number of machine shops that are fabricating some of the stainless steel equipment. Um, you are starting to see more aquaculture equipment available through marine stores. Hamilton Marine or Brooks Trap Mill is now offering fuzzy rope um, and some of the other oyster cages and that kind of thing that, um, you know, when we started in 2016, it was uh, all about figuring out how to how to import all of that equipment and um, the fun process of, of going through customs and getting a customs broker, um, all of the things that I didn't realize would be in education when we started aquaculture. Um, there are so many of those small pieces. Um, so go to, the, you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a picture of our harvest barge. You may notice this sitting in Seal or in Crow Cove uh, when the two days that we're not out uh, harvesting, that is typically where, where we keep it. Um, and we tow it out to the rafts uh, twice a week for harvest and also for days when we're doing maintenance and restocking and, and all of that. Um, you can see the slide coming off of the left is where the mussels come up. Um, and then are fed into that the blue conveyor that begins the the harvesting process. Um, one of the things, particularly this time of year, is um, muscle drop off, and so that's why you want to have that, that slide there. And actually, that sort of first generation, we're we're in the process of of getting more of a harvest conveyor. Uh, because as the water warms, mussels don't biss on as hard to the line, and so you get more and more drop off. In it's in the winter months, they are um, much more attached, and you don't have to worry so much about losing product as you're bringing it to the surface. Go ahead. So uh, the line is coming out of the water. You may notice, uh, I don't know if any of you recognize uh, Jay Legier is uh, one of uh, our fearless uh, employees and he's actually still uh, a high school. Uh, he's going to be a senior this year. Um, he is working with us full time during the summer months, but is also participating as part of the Islesboro Central School Pathways Program interested in marine industries. And so he comes to work with us on the mussel farm two days a week throughout the school year and um, has been both a great contribution to our team, um, but also really nice to have that collaboration with the school. So, and, and he's young and he's strong, so he's helping get those mussels up onto the conveyor and you can go to the next slide. Uh, they're getting stripped off and then that, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't, confident that videos would work. So I have show movement, but we're gonna have to visualize it. The, uh, the conveyor uh, brings the muscles up and into a hopper for the next, which, and the next, this machinery is, is a declumping machine. So, you know, they come up, they're all bisque together. This helps separate them into individual muscles um, so that they can be uh, 
taken, cleaned and taken to the next step. Go ahead. So this is just a rotating drum that they come out on the other side and one area of inspection as we look for broken muscle shells before they go to the next cleaning process, which is the debissing machine, um, which is pictured here. The debissing machine removes those beards, the, you know, the kind of creamish, brownish strings that, you know, they adhere to the rocks and to ropes with. Um, this machine removes them by having a series of sort of count rotating ribbed rods. And so it tumbles the muscles and it sucks the beard down into them and, and slices them cleanly. So it allows us to get a good clean muscle. Uh, and then it is pushed into that, in the previous slide, it pushed the final step on the water is a grading table. So those rods rotate um, closest to us and what that's doing is sorting the muscles by size so that uh, the small ones that are too small to sell are, are returned to the water and those that are harvest are uh, market size are put on the boat, which is the next picture. So each of those small exactics is full of muscles as is the, the trays on top. We've been, um, this was from a harvest just uh, a couple of weeks ago um, and probably have about 2,800 pounds on board. Um, that all get unloaded using the winch at the ferry and then put on a refrigerated truck and brought up to the boatyard kind of for the final step. And this is, this is what it looks like and what's going on uh, right next door at the moment. Uh, we have, we, we built a building specifically at the boatyard for uh, this final mus muscle processing. It was a requirement in order to become wholesale seafood dealers, which I can talk a little bit about, but it was required to have a variety of different um, things. It could be HACCP certified. What they're doing here is doing the final inspection for broken muscles. Um, and the muscles go in a hopper, go back into a conveyor, and the far left of that image is, is a uh, scale. So they fills the hopper to the weight that you set for it and you push, you put a hold a bag underneath the, the hopper and it, it fills up to your specifications. Uh, we box it uh, based on where it is getting shipped to and the majority of the product goes off island on the first ferry the next morning after harvest. Um, the majority of it at this point is getting shipped uh, to regional to Boston as a regional hub and then sent out to uh, distributors all over all over the country, uh, which is really exciting and a huge step forward from where we were last year. Um, but we are pleased that we also uh, deliver ourselves locally to a number of restaurants, particularly in Camden, um, and of course to our island market and um, and able to offer retail here on the island. Um, so that's sort of, and, and then they're ready to enjoy with a nice glass of wine and chunk of bread and you've got dinner. Um, so that's what the process looks like from <laughs> seed to table. Uh, one of the learning things that we had when we first started out was um, you can grow mussels, you can grow seafood as a harvester and, uh, and sell directly to a wholesale seafood distributor. Um, and we did that for the first year, year and a half, and then quickly realized that with the regulations um, that are required, you need to get, there needs to be, during the summer months, but 18 hours is the maximum amount of time from when you can get your product out of the water until it can, should be sold to a wholesale seafood dealer. Um, and with the time it takes to harvest and prepare them, um, there's just no way that it can, we can do that and get the mussels 
off on the last ferry and to market within that 18 hour window. And so we began the unanticipated process of um, becoming wholesale seafood dealers and built a building to become certified and got our HACCP training and, and all of that. Um, and it was one of the business decisions that we really uh, wrestled with quite a bit because we thought, well, would it be easier to take the mussels and have them processed on the mainland? Probably, um, at the end of the day. But at the same time, what we, you know, this is our home. We felt like we want to keep the jobs that are created from this here on the island and um, support as much as we, as some support as much as we can. So, um, so we went all in. <laughs> um, as Craig mentioned, we have grown exponentially, which was which was planned. Um, it takes 18 months to get the product to harvest. So in we got our first seed lines in the water in 2016. And in 2017, we harvested and sold 700 pounds of mussels and had never been more thrilled. Um, in uh, 2018, um, we harvested several thousand pounds of mussels and again, we're thrilled. Um, and then in 2018 is when really things started to pick up. Uh, I have to say we learned a lot about uh, seed collection during those first two years um, and missed it, largely missed the set the first year because we were talking with farmers down in Casco Bay and the time that they used to, to collect their seed. And interestingly, you would think it was further south. And so the seed set came earlier for them than it did for us. And in fact, the reverse was true. And so it was a, a learning process of, under, of getting to know our site and uh, what was happening in the water there. Um, so last year we harvested 50,000 pounds. Um, we were actively looking to grow our market at that point. We knew that we had more mussels that we could harvest and could sell. Um, but we were a little bit gun shy on the marketing because we weren't, we didn't want to market a product. We didn't know how to market a product that we didn't have yet. You can't say, hey, we grow the best mussels, trust us, until you've got enough mussels to sell and where you feel confident that once you have an interested customer that you can uh, fill that market continuously. Um, because one of the things about mussels that we've learned is, you know, there's a lot, there's around probably half a dozen larger rope grown mussel farmers in the state of Maine, really not that many. Um, and there is a huge and continuous supply of rope grown mussels coming out of Prince Edward Island. And uh, generally, it's a cheaper product. It's often a smaller muscle. I would go out on a limb to say it's a slightly inferior product, and it, and it typically sells for a lower price point. But uh, when it comes to the seafood um, market, they are in constant supply. And so if you cannot um, show that you can grow a product reliably and and be able to deliver it to market to your customers in a reliable fashion, it doesn't necessarily matter how, how high quality it is, they're gonna go with what they know that they can get consistently. Um, so uh, just really in the past uh, three months, our market is getting to a place where uh, we are running at just about full capacity um, and harvesting about 5,000 pounds a week. Um, which is great, and uh, if folks want to learn talk more about the market side, I can I can give some more information, sort of about how the the actual COVID crisis really changed things for us, and and our market expanded pretty drastically um, as a result of some of those changes. Um, but what I I just saw that that John had asked a question about water warming and lobsters are moving north. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to take questions now, but I'm, I'm happy to do that. So 
Um, so the question is, the water is warming, lobsters are moving north, is increasing water temperature a problem for keeping the mussel industry here in Maine? Uh, which is a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, the, with the water changing, really with any uh, natural resource-based industry, there are a tremendous number of unknowns. Right now, uh, we, mussels have a pretty broad temperature range that they can um, be grown in. And uh, we are uh, sort of in the middle of that. So at, at, at this point, there's not a tremendous concern about uh, sort of migrating to having the water warm and having mussels migrate too far north um, in the way that lobsters are, and certainly in an um, in a pretty remarkable way, the way the Maine uh, shrimp industry has virtually disappeared from um, Maine waters. Um, but Thank you, Mary. You just queued that up perfectly. Um, actually, one of the, the larger um, issues, I think, as water starts to warm for the mussel industry is how does that change the predators um, and other things that are happening in the ecosystem to um, impact what's happening? So the, what you may have noticed on the images is that each of our rafts is lined in uh, nets. The, that is because our biggest um, pest is actually the eider duck. An eider duck can eat its body weight and muscles every single day. And uh, so when they are here, if we do not have uh, nets surrounding us, they will absolutely decimate our, uh, our population. And they love seed mussels. They're like little candies for them. It's, it's, they'll, they'll eat the larger ones, but they prefer the seed mussels. Um, and there's really nothing more heartbreaking than getting a good seed set and then seeing the eiders enjoying it so much. Um, some of the other pests um, or things that we're dealing with, uh, we've had, luckily, knock on wood, at this point, um, starfish is not an issue for us. But uh, two years ago, it was a tremendous problem. Who would have thought that you could dislike a starfish, but they can also eat a tremendous number of uh, mussels and really decimate our lines. Um, and then actually last spring, uh, there was a huge barnacle set. And so that barnacles don't destroy the meat in the mussels, but it takes, it really increases the uh, manpower required to clean the mussels to get all of that out so that they have the nice clean shells that folks expect getting to market. So. Those are some of the things that we have noticed as far as pests. And I can only imagine that um, we are at the beginning of that learning curve. And as things change in the water, we're going to start, see new, start seeing new things. Some that may help um, our muscles grow, but certainly others that uh, are going to be a challenge that we're going to need to figure out how to address. So <clears throat> let me just speak up for a moment, uh, Shay, to thank you for uh, this marvelous presentation. I love the, the evolution of your story and the fact that it was an idea in Josh's head, apparently, some years ago. And then you acquired um, some of the important expertise through your work at Island Institute. So it's a fascinating story. And I know we're going to have some questions coming along, but I think Craig Olson had one of the first ones. So I'll turn it over to him right now. I, actually, I had two, but I'm gonna go with one at this point. Um, Shay, I was wondering, when, as you look back on, you know, kind of when you were starting this in 2016, are you kind of hitting the numbers you thought you would hit? And the second half of that is, do you see um, opportunities for expansion beyond the beyond the um, the leases that you have now, or are you at, at a good at a good level that you can keep people employed and you can keep the equipment running and you can keep things timed and you can keep suppliers and, and restaurants supplied? Sure. Um, so I can say when we did the business um, model projections in 2016, um, we did not 
adequately plan for what the worst case scenario could be. <laughs> um, and we learned that and largely we learned that because we missed the seed set that first year. And so if you miss the seed set that comes around once a year, that sets you back pretty quickly, 12 months automatically. Um, you know, we did get a little bit, but it was pretty dramatic how, um, how that really delayed how, how we were planning to expand um, by, by 12 months. Um, the second part of the question, can you repeat for me? <laughs> do, do you see, I mean, you're, it seems like you're running at a pretty good cadence now, things are going well, and I'm just wondering if you see yourself expanding with a larger lease site or oh. adding more floats to the sites you have? Yes, so um, that is an excellent question. Um, one of the things that's coming down the line pretty immediately for us is um, there are three different kinds of lease sites that the state of Maine permits, um, a limited purpose aquaculture, an LPA site, which is a 400 square foot, very small site, um, but there's a number of them around Islesboro for oyster growers, which is exciting to see also happening uh, in the uh, waters around Islesboro. Um, and then there's a standard, uh, an experimental lease site, which is a three year lease from the state that allows you to explore to see can you grow the species that you want on that site? Um, is, it, is it a viable site before you um, apply for a standard lease site, which is a 20 year uh, lease with the state? So our lease site at Flat Island, uh, we applied for two years ago now as an experimental lease site. Um, we have found that to be a really productive site for us. It's protected um, and when you're looking at a business, when you're commuting by boat an hour each way to the Northport site, you're actually looking at additional time and expense in that additional travel. So over the next six to nine months, uh, we, will, we do anticipate applying for a standard lease site at our Flat Island site. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I was excited a, a little bit to welcome this opportunity to talk to folks is um, we had hoped to get that application process done in a time so that all of the public hearings that go with it happened on Islesboro in the summertime when folks are here and we can really talk about it. And when COVID hit, uh, the state stopped all, um, all hearing processes, all public um, hearings, and they actually aren't even doing them, allowing them to be done via Zoom right now for aquaculture lease sites. So. Um, I want to make sure that we have lots of opportunity to let folks know that that we're going through that and if folks have, an have questions about what that looks like or feels like it's not tremendously different than what's happening there right now but it is one step that we're taking over the coming six months to um, make sure that our business is, is stable over the long term um, and then as far as growth I mean it's interesting we are talking to other um, mussel farmers. And I think that there, there are opportunities for growth. I think right now with the markets that we've identified, we could probably be harvesting at least three days a week. Um, but with the manpower that we have, that's not a possibility because we need to, you know, our, we have a great team of people and they work tremendously hard to ensure that things are working well in the muscle rafts at the same time that we're launching boats on time, at the same time that we're getting moorings and floats done. And um, so it's really the same group of people that are working on the water doing all of those different things. And if we could hire another two people full time year round, we probably would look to expand both the number of days that we're harvesting. And at that point, maybe we would look at um, and if it made sense to add a raft or two, I don't think that you would, I don't anticipate additional exponential growth. Um, frankly, nine rafts is a tremendous amount to maintain and be done well. And I'd rather make sure that we're doing something and doing it well, rather than um, grow for the sake of growth. Um, I think the other thing that we're looking to explore is the possibility of adding additional species. And this is really, you know, in its infancy stage when, right when we got started in, well, I'll start with the first one because it's more concrete. Um, 
one of the questions and concerns for shellfish uh, related to um, climate change is ocean acidification and the impact that that may have on shellfish shells, on mussel bis, and on the shells itself. Um, and there has been research done um, by folks at Bigel Labs. I know the Island Institute has been involved in looking at um, what the what the benefit is. There a benefit of co-locating kelp and shellfish on the same farm? Do you basically do you, can you get sort of a halo effect of that uh, reduces the impact of ocean acidification and reduces that carbon dioxide in the water around a shellfish farm? Um, and there's been some pretty exciting uh, results. It's definitely still in the works, but there have been indications that there is a, a positive effect. Um, one of my former colleagues at the Island Institute went on to uh, leave to run Atlantic Sea Farms, who uh, does value added kelp processing. Um, they're a kelp farm in that they create, um, they, uh, develop kelp seed and then work with partner farms to get that seed into the water to grow out and then uh, get a purchase and sales agreement to agree to purchase the kelp back from those farmers. So um, it's my hope over the coming fall that perhaps we could start putting some kelp in the water around our mussel farm. We had a very, very small amount this year and um, I would say there was some skepticism about whether or not it was worth the effort. And uh, what I have heard from the guys on the water is we need more kelp. Uh, <laughs> that they actually can see a visual difference in the shell density in the areas um, closest to where that kelp was harvested. So I think um, for uh, a small, um, different revenue stream that would be, um, you know, we're interested in it from the revenue stream, but primarily we're interested in it because uh, it gives a little bit of a buffer to uh, increase the ecosystem um, benefits of the, the farm. Shay, if I could jump in, we have four questions teed up. So get a sip of water. <laughs> and um, first up is Peter Rothschild. Peter, would you like to go ahead? I Michael will have to unmute him if he's, yes. there he is, he's coming up. Peter? myself how's that <laughs> all right all i was wondering about is uh you know just generally the economics of the whole operation uh it looks like you had a big investment at the beginning and i just wondered are you breaking even and what's the best case scenario how profitable could this be Sure. So um, there are, there's a reason why I think you see more oyster farms in the state than you see mussel farms. And that is largely because, as, as Peter noted, um, it's a tremendously capital intensive business to get into. Um, I would say we probably have about $750,000 in investment in the infrastructure that we have in the water and in the mussel processing building. Um, and it has been, we've, we've learned uh, what worst case scenario projections look like uh, when they go badly. But the good news is that um, we, at this stage, with how harvesting the volume that we are, we are breaking even um, and are starting to uh, make gains on the capital investments that we put in. Um, and are thinking about what additional capital investments might be required. Uh, so I think, you know, it, you don't see rich muscle farmers, um, <laughs> but I think that you can make a, a good living. Um, you know, I think you can make a, a living for your family and you can make a living for the families of 
the people that are working on the farm. Thank you. Great. Mary Calkins, would you like to ask your question? Hi, it's actually Carl Kister with Mary. And um, my question was about um, the seed set. Um, we used to see a lot more wild mussels um, everywhere, and they seem so seem to be so few these days. I'm just curious how you're getting the seed set if there's so few mussels, uh, wild mussels around, and, and if you know why. Yes, so um, thank you, that's a really great question. Um, and there has definitely been a marked decrease in the number of mussels that you see in the intertidal zone. Um, there are a number of theories about why that is. Um, I've heard uh, green crab predation. I've heard um, because of warming temperatures, the, what we notice in the farm is that they don't bis on to the ropes as well when the water is warm. And as temperatures um, increase, are they not able to bis onto the rocks as, um, as hard? And so they may be there, but they may be no longer in the inner tidal, but in, um, in more shallow water. Um, I have not seen, I guess we should, we haven't seen a tremendous decrease in the number of seed mussels that we are observing on mooring lines and, and we are getting um, a good seed set on both of our lease sites. So I, I, it's a little bit hard because I, I can't say I know where the mussel beds are, but I can say that we're, we're still seeing a really healthy mussel seed set and that uh, what we hope is that actually the presence of the farm and having all of those wild mussels that are, that are spawning hopefully uh, increases the wild population as well. All right, thank you for that, Shay. Next up is, I'm going to um, hop over John Rexwaller because I think he's already had a question. We'll come back to you, John. Sue Stafford, would you like to pose your question? There, is that okay? Yep, we can hear you. Um, Shay. Rumor has it that you guys are thinking about um, moving into scallop um, production. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> not. I would say not. Not this year. Um, one when we, one of the mussel farmers uh, that we worked closely with, it was really instrumental in helping us get in the water and get our gear set correctly. Uh, was also growing scallops and was interested in expanding their scallop um, and partnering with us on on growing scallop scallops here in Penobscot Bay. And so we did a lot of exploration. This was about a year, 18 months ago. Uh, we did a lot of exploration and are definitely interested in that possibility. Um, but it was one of those things that we came, both Josh and I sort of had a gut, had a gut feeling like, there's diversification and then they're spreading yourself too thin. And um, we really wanted to make sure that we had the muscle farm well in hand and had a strong product, had a strong market. And once that was moving and we felt like we had multiple years where, where things were staying on the rails that, that that might be a more appropriate time to start exploring other species. And so I, I definitely, there's a lot of interest there. It's really fascinating to uh, learn about how to uh, grow and support, you know, different species growth um, on the farm and, and how that fits in with the natural ecosystem. And I think shellfish and seaweed aquaculture in particular has a lot of benefits both ecologically and, and in growing sustainable, uh, healthy, yummy protein. So um, I'm not going to say no in the future, but I'm going to we want to make sure we have our business right now well in hand before we do too much expansion. Thank you, Shay. I'm going to um, ask Sunny Ladd if she'd like to ask her question. And then after that, John, we'll come back to John Rexwaller. 
And Sonny, I know you're off the island, so it's great right. to have you as a, a listener today. Well, this has been terrific, and we're sorry not to be in Maine this summer. We're in North Carolina, and that relates to my question. Shay, I'm curious to whom you sell your mussels, and also whether the closing down of restaurants in many parts of the country, including where we are now, where I am now in North Carolina, poses a challenge for you. Yes. Thank you, and I, um, yes, it definitely does. I think with uh, just about any seafood, um, with most U.S. seafood uh, industries, they saw a dramatic and immediate drop in sales. We were harvesting, I would say, maybe 1,500 pounds a week um, through uh, the middle of March, and it within a week went from 1500 pounds to zero and it stayed at zero for three weeks. Um, and it was a really interesting time because both the seafood dealers that we largely sell to um, and the restaurants, you know, they, everyone was sort of scrambling with how to adjust to this new normal. And I think one of the, um, things that really helped us is that go through that process was the relationships that we developed and the conversations that we had with the seafood distributors while we all were going through that challenging time. Um, and so that helped to strengthen some of the relationships that we had just started and when the market crashed and, and nobody was able to sell anything. Um, we started comparing, you know, what other people were seeing or what they were hearing. Um, one of the other things that uh, when we started harvesting again um, was a trend that has stayed is um, many of the seafood distributors that we sell to had primarily just been direct to restaurants. That was the only thing that they did and many, many of them ended up pivoting and doing direct to consumer sales, either online sales and shipping or uh, home delivery. Um, we, one of the very first markets, you know, even locally that opened up was um, the Lost uh, Kitchen in Freedom, the, uh, you know, acclaimed restaurant who weren't able to open start at an online farmer's market. And they were one of the first places that we were able to sell to beyond the island that got our product back into the hands of consumers. So it was a combination of folks that were able to think creatively to get for how to get the product back into the hands directly of consumers, which is still happening. And then the other thing that happened that um, helped us was that suddenly all of the restaurant owners and the folks who are making the decisions, the, the head chefs, uh, who wouldn't necessarily, may in the past have been difficult to get your product into their hands, um, were at home cooking for themselves. And so for those seafood distributors that were still um, operational or still sending out samples to folks. Again, it was a great relationship building time because they said, hey, we've got a new product. Um, do you want to try it out? And so it, it actually, I think that helped us to grow our market so that, um, you know, right now we are selling more than we had sold prior to the crisis. Um, now I fully am aware of um, how quickly that tap could get shut down again and um, on the restaurant side of things. And so I do think it's it's a combination of, of figuring out how to diversify your market so that you keep some direct to consumer um, markets and, and restaurant markets because I think that can help weather some of the storms. Well, you showed um, excellent resilience, Shay. Now, um, John Rexwaller said you answered his question, which was how your sales went up during COVID. And we have a question from Tanya Schwab, which I'm gonna paraphrase because we're close to running out of time. She wanted to know if, if she can find your product in Florida, where apparently she lives, Tanya Schwab. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so I know that our product is making it to Florida, but one of the challenges from my perspective with the seafood chain is um, is actually once it goes to our distributors, we hear some of the places that it goes, but I can't necessarily say, 
yes, go to XYZ Market is where you can you can pick it up in your part of Florida. So um, if you want to talk offline, I'm happy. If you want to call Islesboro Marine, I'm happy to explore and talk with our seafood distributors that are sending products to Florida. But unfortunately, I can't give an easy answer to say, here's the market where you can find us. Um, Shay, thank you. We are usually as uh, pretty disciplined about bringing the program to a close at 6.30. I see we've reached 6.30, but um, I've, I, I for one have found this enormously informative and the questions just show how much more, um, they tease out so much more information that you have at your um, control through all this experience you've built up. So thank you so much for sharing it. I hope this program will be helpful in getting the word out about your uh, need for uh, hearings regarding future leases. And I'll just say for the audience, we have recorded this. It will be available at the islesboroforum.org website as is last week's program now also available. So Shay, thank you very, very much. And I'm sure you're gonna have people stopping you on the street and on the island everywhere um, following up on this. It was most entertaining and informative. So Thanks. over and out until next week when we go from aquaculture to opera. So we're a versatile speaker series and we hope you'll all join us next week as well. Thank you, Shay, and all the best to you. Thank you. You're welcome.